Hi everyone, welcome to this tutorial. This time around I wanted to build on some of the techniques we'd laid down previously, like the concept of parenting the grease pencil object to an actual 3D object, but taking it much further this time by having multiple characters engaging in a more complex action sequence, and raising the overall quality of the imagery by utilizing 3D lighting, effects modifiers, and depth of field. Let's take a look at the finished shot before digging in really deep. Now, even though that's only a 12 second clip, there's, all, there's so much process that's gone into this that I've decided to split this into a few parts. Part one focuses on how I explore a scene using an environment. Then my thought process behind working through the 3D layout of a character and cameras. Part two focuses exclusively on the grease pencil, so all of the drawings and the animation. Part three then focuses on the effects modifiers, the 3D lighting, and depth of field on the grease pencil. And finally, part four is a time lapse of the entire process if you wish to watch that. Simon Prunty asked a really good question uh, in the, the comment section of the, the preview video for this. My question is, before you start this process, do you roughly thumb your idea down or write a rough shot selection or do you jump right in and use the camera to explore selections? Well, the answer is that usually it's a mixture of both of those things or, or all of those things. Uh, many, most of the times, yes, I will use thumbnails to think through a scene. I'll do that on paper. It really helps get that initial kind of thought process going. Um, very good way. I mean, that's the, the purpose of thumbnails is to, to think through things before you commit to them. Uh, in this case, however, I didn't. When I started this scene, I had a general idea of what I wanted to do. So it was going to be a um, an alien landscape with a character uh, making his way through the landscape being chased by a bunch of aliens and he was going to have to take them on or try and get out of the way. So the first thing I did was actually build this environment. This was actually sculpted in a program called 3D Coat. I didn't actually use Blender to sculpt this purely because I just haven't got around to learning how to sculpt in Blender and at the time I was experimenting in 3D Coat. This was a sphere that I basically just cut the living daylights out of I, w I wasn't planning anything, I wasn't really thinking very much when I was doing it, I was just pop, 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 whatever feels good, slash, 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 chuck a bit of texture on, and then you got all these cool shapes and stuff, you know, it's a, it's a pretty interesting in organic environment you get from this, and so I'd highly recommend taking a look at that. I will be looking into Blender sculpting soon because uh, it looks really good, especially in the new, new versions, the sculpting looks like it's getting better. Before I started looking too much around, I wanted to get a little bit of atmosphere in here. So if I pop it into Eevee, you can see now that I've got atmospheric lighting, right? This is actually really, really easy and quick to do. I love it. Um, it gives everything a real nice depth. Okay, so how we achieve that is basically, we need some scene lights. So um, we've got these scene lights up here. We go into object mode. So scene lights, this one is a spotlight over here that's yellow. We've got a, a another a point light over there. I put a bunch of lights randomly in the environment to begin with um, to, to get this initial setup going. Uh, if we go to the shading node here, okay, and if I click click this on so you can actually see where the lights are. So how, how I've achieved this volumetric uh, looking thing here, the fog, is this down here. So let me scroll in a bit, right? So down here in your uh, the bottom panel of your shader business put world on right because it'll probably be on object by default stick world on and then you need to so i think you'll have background will be there this volume scatter won't be there okay add shader volume scatter and then one of these will pop up so then you can change the you basically plug that into the volume like that so if i get rid of that it doesn't do anything right so if i plug it in plug into the volume it'll be really dense to begin with it'll be something like two full points uh, that's too much so drop it down to something like 0 0.1 0 0.2 or maybe even 0, 0 something depending it'll look different depending on the scale of your environment and then you can you can change the color or what whatever you want that mist so imagine this is the mist 
that's that's the uh, the way I think about it. And then your lights within the scene will will affect that color. Um, they'll kind of do a color mix kind of thing, right? So if you pop your scene lights, now we create. Remember, we create lights the same way we create anything. Is when we're in object mode, we hold Shift A, and then we go down to light, and then point is the the most used one. It's the kind of round light. Sun is the one you use for a for a big overview lighting. And so if I'm clicking in there now and I go over here to the light, if I go to color, I could change that. Or I can change the intensity of it. I guess. And then by moving them in and out in the environment. Sorry, jump down here. You can see the lighting changes, right? And you get all this dramatic um, shadow being cast through the uh, the volumetric. So that's how you do that, right? And then you can experiment to your heart's content about how you want that to look in your scene if you indeed want to use this kind of thing. But for an alien environment, atmospheric alien environment, it's perfect. Once I had the lighting set up, so I had a bit of depth, a bit of atmosphere, uh, I started basically scouting out the environment, right? So I was probably like, you know, thinking, oh, maybe I could go over here, maybe I could do something over here. There's lots of nooks and crannies in here that I'll probably do in, I'll use in. Look, it's like, there's like really cool little caves and stuff that are purely accidental. So I knew I wanted him to be, ex, you know, topside basically, and they're kind of running along and, and do a little slide, little dodge. So this area over here looked really nice. So what I was looking for here was some nice sort of terrain in the foreground where the actual action was gonna take place and then some nice framing elements in the background, right? So this stuff, these these arcs in the background were really appealing to me. That, that makes quite a nice background um, a background feature, right? Like more, more interesting than looking out over here. So then I was looking around and thinking, okay, so where are we gonna start? It's just, it really is a case of just feeling this stuff, like looking for composition, like, oh, I'd like to end over there maybe, right? Or maybe, okay, so maybe I'll start up here. So using, uh, so this is something I still advise to use, the lock, to 3D cursor thing, it just helps navigation, right? So you do that by, uh, again, shift and right click to make the, the cursor go there. And then if you've selected this lock to 3D cursor on in the drop down menu there, it'll pivot around that point. I find it really useful for, for just scouting around environments, right? So then I'm thinking, okay, so maybe he could come up over the brow of this hill and then the camera can kind of come down here and we can just follow that action. Yeah, this is good. It's a nice little dip for him to slide. He can, oh yeah, he can project. So while you're doing this then, I, when, I, when I was doing this, the ideas start coming out then. Yeah, so you, you, then you're like, you're riffing off the environment. You're thinking, oh, he's gonna slide down here. Maybe the momentum of him will launch him up here and then he'll land here. And maybe like we can get a bit of a scuffle going over here and then maybe he runs up over there and maybe we'll end up here, right? So that's about it for now. I've kind of decided that's roughly where I'm going with it, right? That's what roughly where the scene's gonna go for me. So then I, I make my camera. Again, I've, I've, I've talked about that in other videos, but I'll just quickly, shift A, camera. Camera will appear. I've already made one, so I'll just press zero to go into my camera. And then I started keyframing out the camera. So with your camera selected, move it to the position you wanna be in, uh, press I, lock rot scale or i mean you could put the automatic keyframing on if you want to right uh it's definitely an easy and organic way to do things uh what i find is whenever i do that i accidentally move things and things in the background start spinning and i'm like why the hell is that moving because i had automatic keyframing on and i forgot that i had it on so i tend to not use it so anyway so this was the kind of camera angle that i went for then Somebody asked in one of the comments on one of the videos about uh, camera pathing. Um, I couldn't find a comment, otherwise I would have uh, highlighted like I have the other ones. The question was basically, um, or the statement was that you could create a, a line, a path, and then you could constrain the camera to that path to get a really nice smooth camera mo motion, right? Which you can absolutely do. And I will be doing on some projects. But generally, I don't do that. And the reason is because I like to get inside the camera. Right? I kind of work a bit more like a cameraman. So I like to get inside the camera. And then I like to 
do the whole lock camera to view thing. It means that whenever you're moving it out, you're actually controlling the camera. Okay. So if I just put this on the dub sheet a minute so you can see the camera keyframes, what I'll do is I'll, I'll start where I want to start and I'll keyframe it and then I'll move the camera to like the next position that I want it and I'll keyframe that and then I'll go to the next keyframe and I'll do that and I'll do that. So I'm kind of, I feel more like I'm the cameraman down on the ground going through and kind of planning this stuff out, even though, at, you know, in the initial stages, um, this would have just been the the previous man going through this right and you can still get plenty of smooth camera moves doing it like this anyway but i will definitely be experimenting with uh, some camera pathing on future projects just a quick note on uh, keying these these objects out um i haven't shown you like my here i am keying them out because i've already touched on that on that in other videos um and it's the same thing every time you just move your your object where you want it to be you press i and you press lock rotate scale and then that gives you the keyframe so with each of these characters we can click on we can see where i put the various keyframes in order to give them the path that i want them to have in order to act interact with the character so i'll show you object by object now the order in which i laid this out so when you're thinking through these kind of scenes we have um, where i call like a one versus many sequence we have one main character and that character needs to interact with multiple characters the first thing you kind of need to do is or the way i do it is that you move forward and you think about the path you want that character to take through the scene you think about the main kind of beats um where you want something to happen you think about how big you want to be in frame at that point you think about where they're flowing from where they're going to uh, and then what you might do then is you add in your first enemy character okay so the monkey that was just chasing him there this is the first one we'll see, right? So it's the first one he interacts with. Now I'm just figuring out what he's doing with that. So here he comes, he's chasing him and off he goes, right? So then this is the point then where I'm like, okay, I'll start figuring out how to do that now with the grease pencil. Quick refresher here on how to create the grease pencil object and how to parent that to the 3D object. So here's our uh, 3D object man that we want to parent to, okay? So let's place a cursor near him and let's go shift a grease pencil stroke. This massive stroke will come up, but you can in the grease pencil settings, you can just kind of delete that layer or switch it off. So now that we're in, we make a new grease pencil layer and we, we hold tab to switch to draw mode. And then we can draw our grease pencil man over dude. And there he is. So in order to parent this now, we need to put it back into object mode. We have the grease pencil object selected. We press, we hold shift and select the 3D man. And then we press control P and then object or object keep transform that parents grease pencil object to the 3D man and then wherever he goes, so does the grease pencil. And that's how you do the parenting. So now I start thinking, okay, how is he going to interact with this creature? It's not going to be a monkey, obviously. It's going to be an alien of some kind, but it's hard to know where you are in 3D space. So it, it helps to put something in. So, um, okay, so here he comes, right? So the guy's coming up now and he's kind of like, he's running up with a gun and he's going to turn quickly as he jumps and bang, 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 shoots him. And you can see the thing kind of stops dead there. So that's what's going to happen. He's going to die at that point. So he's then free to move on to the next character, to the next enemy. So alien number two over here. Now, if I switch him on, this one comes up from the foreground. So again, now I'm looking for ways to utilize the depth, uh, depth in the screen space. But we've got someone now coming in from depth of frame to the mid framing, right? So he kind of comes up here. He doesn't actually interact with this character unless I get him to do a shot there. I wanted this guy to show up later, right? So he's kind of kind of do a strike on him, but miss and then kind of carry on with his path. So away he goes and I've kind of tucked him off over there out of sight for the minute. We don't need to worry about him a minute. So then the next one. So the reason that you, reason you do it like this, the reason I do it like this anyway, 
is because if you're doing six characters interacting with another character, you if you try doing all of that straight ahead, you just get, I think you're gonna get you're gonna get overwhelmed for one thing, and I don't think you're gonna get the optimum framing and impact of each of those moments if you're again trying to do all that at the same time. So um, when I approach these scenes, I do it one by one, and then I only do it up to the point usually of impact or the, the most significant moment. So here, he's kind of sliding down, but this, this enemy is going to jump over and knock his gun out of his hand, and then that would be the end of that beat, right? So I forget about this, this enemy now, just like I've forgotten about the other ones, right? Their significant moment, their key moment is done, and now I just keep moving on to the next one. So now we switch on number four. Okay, so the next one he's going to interact with is over here, and he's going to, I wanted him to slash this guy, right? So as he's had the, the gun taken away from him, when he's in close-up here, he's going to pull this knife out and slash. So that's what that represents. And then we've got another one chasing him here. So off we go up here. So then the next couple, I'll put these all on at the same time, just to show you. So then one comes up over the edge, and then the another two come there where he's where he's kind of running off and they leap after him and one almost catches him and then we kind of leave it on a cliffhanger so each of those then those timings those uh the layout of those those blocks those those reference points for me they're all where they want it to be for now we can obviously change them as we go along and refine this but generally speaking this is the idea